We're in something of a sea change in medical ethics right now. When I was in training, and probably when you were too, all of the ethical relationships were defined in terms of a dyadic relationship. The clinician to the patient, the um, researcher to the patient. But that's not really the world we work in now. Increasingly, um, patients are relating to larger complex systems that are interrelated social networks, and that's how we're providing care. And that's changing the way we provide ethics, or at least the way we think about ethical problems. So we've known this to be an issue for some time. This is Mark Ziegler's paper from 40 years ago talking about the changes in confidenti providing confidentiality in, in medicine as with the rise of, of HMOs and healthcare, healthcare third-party payers. Um, this is uh, Chiara Lapura's work. Chiara Lapura is, um, or was until, is at WHO in Jerusalem right now, but was with Doctors Without Borders. And she talked about the problems that Doctors Without Borders was facing when they deploy to militarized areas, that when they go out to militarized areas, often their medical supplies are taken by the Yunta, and the Yunta that's there says, okay, you can treat this village, but you can't treat this village. Or you can treat these soldiers, but you can't treat these soldiers. And the question she began to ask was, well, at what point does compromising how we provide care become complicity in supporting the junta. And if it's complicit, do we not deploy Doctors Without Borders at all? And that's not an easy or straightforward question to answer. It has, has valence in other problems that we face more recently. This is Doug White and Bernie Lowe's paper about how a bedside clinician would consider rationing ventilators in the face of COVID. Um, that's the tip of the spear. I think increasingly we recognize that, yes, it's important to have guidance for the bedside clinician to make those tough decisions, but also the, the reason the bedside clinician is in that situation is because of a series of interrelated social and economic decisions that have been made that have shortened the amount of ventilators available. When I was in training in anesthesia, we had an almost warehouse-sized space in the basement. Now, this was at a small medical school just up the road called UCSF, but there was a big big warehouse size space where we had all these old ventilators that were still in working condition. And in fact, several times throughout my training, I had to bring out and even do like a, what's called a copper kettle anesthetic, where you had to try and figure out how to titrate in just the amount of, of anesthetic to vaporize it in the copper kettle. But the point being that they still worked. But the economics of that is no longer the case. Right? Nobody keeps warehouses like that. And the just-in-time supply chain has shortened the ventilators that are available. There are a number of changes in healthcare staffing I just want to call out. This is Jerry Dew's paper from 2018 that's often retweeted, at least in the pre-Musk twi Twitter era, um, to try and, try and encourage physicians to unionize or at least read their Karl Marx. But it calls out the, the large number of non-clinical healthcare workers that have, a, have become part of the healthcare labor force over the past decade without an increase in the total number of patients that we're seeing. And then this is the slide that they like to trigger in everybody's anger with. This is just the ratio of how much more as a body these non-clinical healthcare workers are paid relative to the clinical workforce. And the point being that healthcare has always existed in the tension between making profit and providing health. They're not perpendicular, but they're also not always in parallel. And that's obviously a source of great friction. And we've seen it, too, in the way that we staff healthcare over the past 15 or 20 years. This is um, Desai's paper in the New England Journal talking about all the many benefits of the eight-hour work week among our trainees, about overall you know, well-being and psychological well-being and improvement in life quality and attracting more labor. There are many, many wonderful things about the change in labor, but we have changed labor to 80-hour work weeks. And many of the more recent fields within healthcare, emergency medicine, my own field within anesthesia, even some of my surgical colleagues, at least anecdotally in the place I've worked, like transplant medicine or pediatric surgery, have moved to more of a shift-based model of one day on, one day off. And that does change our relationship to the patient and changes the social network of how we provide care. So I put that background. So increasingly, medical ethics is becoming the study of so-called wicked problems as opposed to tame problems. Wicked problems defy easy singular formulation. They involve looking at interrelated networks of social values and, and you know, social engineering constructs. And more than true or false, or even necessarily right or wrong, the answers to these problems are, are better or worse. So if I have two points to make in this talk, one is, in our pluralistic multicultural society, we don't have a tome that we can appeal to anymore that is the, the received word of what is right or wrong. But we also don't yet have a methodology of how to empirically study what is 
what we should do in ethical dilemmas in healthcare. So I'd like to today share some of the work we're doing and how we're taking methods that people are using to try and solve these problems. I don't have a definitive answer, but it's great to have a chance to at least share what we're doing. So sometimes it's easier to think about these things in terms of the, the things that are less familiar rather than more familiar. So a lot of my NIH funded research is looking at implementing and the ethical challenges implementing um, AI to healthcare. So my route into AI, studying AI was a little circuitous. My K award, as Jim mentioned, was looking at genome, implementing genomic sequencing into the care of critically ill kids. And what we encountered was this, a quote from a neonatologist in one of our interview-based studies, that the value of the genomic sequencing would be in its predictive power, that we could have that discussion with parents and change our goals of care earlier to comfort as opposed to prolonging suffering with futile intensive care. That in these, these very narrow benefit to burden situations, having some sort of knowledge support or decisional support would be very, very valuable. And there was much talk about using AI tools as assistive knowledge support so that, that variants could be flagged and support clinicians. In a background of changing advocacy around trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and beginning to offer heart surgery for those kids now, I began to ask questions about whether that might propagate a self-fulfilling prophecy, that if we knew or treated something as if it were fatal, it would limit our ability to try and advance care. That's not unique to AI. This is Dominic Wilkinson, who's a neonatologist and ethicist at the Oxford hospitals. And he's talked about self-fulfilling prophecy in his work. And, and the idea being that if you take conditions, extreme prematurity, um, traumatic brain injury in the elderly that we more or less know to be fatal and you treat it as fatal, you are unconsciously or consciously tailoring your care to have a fatal outcome without allowing the space for perhaps innovation in care. Um, I reached out to Nigam Shaw, who has now become a very close collaborator, who's a bioinformaticist here at Stanford, um, who was dealing with the same question of self-fulfilling prophecy in his AI-related work. And this is something he was working on in the mid-teens, the idea of the green button. And it's a great idea. The idea being that as we have these larger and larger pools of data that we can draw from, you could potentially do on-the-fly observational or, or case series studies of if you have a patient that you're at the bedside of and you're trying to figure out how to treat this patient, you could pull from these large data sets, how have other clinicians dealt with this problem? But the self-fulfilling prophecy problem part of this is, and a, you know, a huge data set, it's unlikely people are going to ask the same questions, but the self-fulfilling prophecy problem is how many times can you push the green button and follow its recommendation before you start to self-iterate? which is to say you're no longer seeing what other clinicians are doing. You're seeing what the recommendation was that you should do and you followed it, and then the recommendation of what you should do and you followed it. And the, it's not a straightforward problem. When we asked around and we reached out to the ethics community, they were largely dismissive. Maybe it'll be a problem. Maybe it won't be a problem. And what we lacked to convince people was some sort of method to say, well, this is why, this is in an empirical way why we think this is likely to be problematic. Um, we were fortunate it's not the right word. Soon on the heels of this discussion, though, there were a number of large um, problems that were public with AI tools. There was the Volkswagen emissions scandal with its, its algorithm to evade detection. There was the Uber Greywall scandal, and there was the Cambridge Facebook Analytica scandal, and all that called attention to the fact that this was likely to be a problem as well in healthcare and that we should try and address it. So let me speak about it broadly. Uh, last year, the Director of National Intelligence released this report on the unprecedented amassing of biodata um, by the People's Republic of China. And the value of that data and the fact that the People's Republic of China holds data on the majority of American citizens at this point. We've also seen the CEOs of local and multinational corporations talk about, openly talk about, the desire to monetize um, personalized information, personalized healthcare information. This isn't to vilify either the People's Republic of China or multinational corporations, but merely to point out that key actors in our pursuit of the learning healthcare system, of complex biomedical data, of AI for healthcare, don't necessarily reflexively adhere to Athenian ethics, at least as filtered through the British and American centuries. Um, we've seen, so if you take an ethical issue like privacy, we've already seen um, other nation states view what many Americans would view as violations of their privacy as fundamental to state security. Um, we've seen multinational corporations view what many Americans would view as violations of their privacy as fundamental to their business model, or, and I think we're going to increasingly see this in healthcare, as part of the transactional interaction of getting goods and services from third-party vendors requires surrendering some amount of personal privacy, and that may become an issue for us as well. Um, so if you take something like bias, 
an algorithm that's being designed on a training set of exclusively Han Chinese ancestry for deployment in exclusively Han Chinese population is going to have very different concerns around what bias is latent in that data than, say, AI tools that are being deployed in sub-Saharan Africa, where European and American scholarship on bias, on discrimination may be valuable, but the legacies of colonialism are going to have issues of bias unique entirely to that context. And how to study that is challenging. So uncomfortable as it is to admit, in many ways, many ethical considerations are regional and political. And so this is a slide from the EPA talking about how fossil fuel emitting vehicles had to be you know, tailored to different markets. You know, fossil fuel emissions were different for North American sales than they were for European sales. To some extent, we are going to have to tune AI tools around certain ethical constructs, or at least makes transparent what compromises we have made for sale in different markets. So what are the principles around which we should tune these tools? Well, I, I don't know yet. Nobody really does. Um, Alka Patel with the Department of Defense did some really good work, consensus-based work going around academic centers around the country. Stanford was one of them trying to survey all of the bioinformatics people, all the computer science people of values that they were concerned about. Um, they came up with these five, which seem to encompass the many, many frameworks that are getting, getting published around principles for AI. That AI tools be responsible, that, that humans should exercise judgment and remain responsible, that they be equitable and avoid unintended bias, that they be traceable, transparent, that they be reliable, that there be an explicit domain of use and it's safety tested, and that it be governable, that people can turn them off. Um, as an aside, I think in the near term responsibility is going to be the most important of these. So extrapolating from non healthcare context, which is what we're having to do for a lot of the AI things, there are a number of narratives of what went wrong with um, Boeing, what has been going wrong at Boeing and what went wrong with the Boeing 737 Max MCAS software. But I think for this, what's it, the narrative that's important is that when they first deployed it, they were deploying it among largely American combat trained pilots who could simply turn off the assistive tool when they began to feel that it was was behaving badly or that something was wrong with the flight. They had enough intuitive sense to change that. Where they ran into their horrible crashes was when the tool was used with much less experienced pilots. And so I think that in healthcare, we may have that same problem. You know, a healthcare entity that isn't using, sorry, the major value of AI right now is that it reduces expensive labor, right? It's still having trouble crossing the chasm and proving its value in terms of clinical outcomes. But a healthcare entity that isn't using AI tools right now risks incurring significant cost, labor costs relative to an, uh, a healthcare system that isn't. But the danger is obviously that we will have gotten rid of a skilled labor pool that would be available to correct a missteering or misguided tool before we have demonstrated that the AI tool is in fact better or even equivalent than the clinicians or labor, or labor pool fundamental to allocation of material supplies within healthcare that, that it replaces. Okay. Um, Michael Abramoff at University of Iowa is the first person to get FDA approval for an AI tool. This is that AI tool, IDX. It's an uh, autonomous screening tool for diabetic retinopathy. Um, Michael reached out to me as he was moving through the FDA process for help addressing some of the ethical concerns, chiefly around um, liability and autonomy for this. We have an NIH grant now working with Risa Wolf at Hopkins looking at using this tool to screen um, pediatric diabetic patients, particularly seeing if it can replace screening that has been lost during COVID. Um, we went through the process and came up with a few additional principles that we think are of value to guide AI tools, that the AI be you know, non-maleficent, that it doesn't do any harm, that there be patient benefit, that it be autonomous, that the patient still be in control of its healthcare, and that liability for the AI system is directly related to the degree of autonomy that it proposes. And similarly, that it be equitable. Um, like I said, I don't know what principles we're going to hinge on, but it looked like with the National Defense Authorization Act that came out last year, and now with last or September, um, the AI guidance from the White House, these seem to be the principles from FDA and from Department of Defense that they're going to hinge AI tools around and are going to use to guide them. Um, a couple other threads that don't fit neatly into these principles, but I think are worth just mentioning um, that are probably going to wind up having to get regulated. Um, but bias, we've talked about. This is the off-sided ProPublica article from 2016 that talked about the Compass recidivism protection software that made bias into a, a larger discussion nationally. Um, it was to help judges in predicting who was likely to be a recidivist offender, and it was very racially biased. Um, and this, this article called that out. This is Gisbrook's 
Gitchberg's work with the Framingham study, just showing how the Framingham risk predictors don't really work for other populations than the Caucasian population, they underestimate or overestimate risk. We've known this to be the case in healthcare just as a sampling error in terms of who we've had represented in the data that we study. It has implications for AI tools. This is an interview-based study we were doing with oncologists looking at um, implementing novel chemotherapeutic tools. Um, we have a health wealth race gradient dilemma, how to protect against the bias of mortality prediction. It reinforces existing inequalities. You get comfort care and instead of advanced therapeutics, what's the solution? Does it help if the AI, AI is more fair? If you're gonna die soon, even if it's from health inequities, aggressive high dose chemotherapy isn't good which is to say that the AI itself can't inherently fix the social um, race-based problems that are baked into healthcare. And how to address those are not clear. Privacy of personal data is problematic to address. We've seen that with Royal Free Hospital and Google, we saw it with Ascension Health and, and Google Hospital. It's not so straightforward. Um, this is criticism of the neonatal blood spot programs that many states have had. There have been criticisms levied that in fact, the access to those neonatal blood spots were too restrictive. So people donated their, their baby's blood spots, but none of the research that was intended to be done could be done, or, or limitations on the research that could be done were present. This is something that, like all of us, is struggling with, with now. How do you get that sweet spot between getting adequate data to actually learn appropriately, but protect the privacy of, of participants? Um, ownership of data is going to be a problem as well. We saw that with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Page AI deal. Again, this isn't to call out Page AI. It was an AI tool designed to interpret pathologic slides and accelerate interpretation of that you know, to, to improve throughput. Um, many of the faculty at Memorial Sloan Kettering complained that the intellectual property that the, the tool had used was theirs, that they had designed, you know, that it was their years of training and years of labor that allowed this tool to understand what it did and that they had some ownership over the AI tool. Whether this will have any traction, I asked my colleague at the law school, Michelle Mello, she felt frankly, we had all pretty much surrendered any kind of right to our intellectual property by being employees of academic centers. But I think it's something that will, will bear out. It's come up in our research as well as Kaiser has tried to implement its suicide risk prediction for adolescents. Many of the psychiatrists and psychologists similarly feel that they have spent years laboring away trying to identify who will be high risk patients and that they have some ownership and potentially some responsibility to their patients as to how this tool is deployed. Um, accountability for failings is not straightforward. That has played out more publicly. This is the New York Times article around the Starbucks clopenings problem. A large part of the Starbucks workforce is temporary people trying to put themselves through school, single parents. They built an AI tool to try and identify how to optimize shifts. You know, like it would make sense, right? If you're running a lemonade stand and you know one day is going to have an ultimate Frisbee tournament, it's going to be really hot. Having your lemonade stand heavy staff that day as opposed to day it's raining is probably a good idea. Um, so this found a number of things, one of which was that it was far more efficient to have the same person who closed the store at 11 p.m. or midnight, reopen it again at 4 a.m. the next morning, and, and also to allow flexible staffing models. And so the people who were working there found themselves having their entire lives upended on being, able, on being unable to get childcare because of the AI tool that had been deployed. They tried to fix it, but obviously damage had been done to the labor workforce and who was responsible was not totally clear. This is Kathy O'Neill, who at the time of this publication was a mathematician in, at Columbia. She has subsequently gone into private industry. It's a good read, but she called out the same thing for credit, credit prediction scores, that it often takes far more and better quality data to rebut the output from an AI tool than it actually the data upon which it was based. Okay, so... How do we, if those are the principles we're tuning around, that may be the easier problem to solve. How do we actually identify ethical problems and challenges with tools before they become consequential? Well, the current model for um, ethical evaluation um, ha has some limitations, right? It's intended to be beneficial, but, but from simply staffing of the number of ethicists available, it doesn't scale to the throughput of new technologies that are, that are coming into healthcare. Um, it's also unclear in our multicultural pluralistic society how free from bias um, the cadre of ethical review, in fact, is. That's problematic because 
doubt in ethical review encourages circumvention, which is in fact much easier to do nowadays as the lines between what is research, what is QI, what is healthcare infrastructure continue to blur. We've seen this play out somewhat publicly during the last presidential administration. There was the NIH appointed the Fetal Tissue Research Ethics Advisory Board, um, which was intended to consult and make recommendations for research that was deemed fundable by NIH. It didn't play out Rates, they basically rejected all fetal stem cell research because of the particular views of the participants of the panel. Um, because of the problems with ethics review, many bioinformaticists have begun to turn to the idea of fairness in AI tools. So this idea that you could specify a priori groups that you then identify whether it's deploying fairly across these populations. This may be what we use. It is what we're starting to use here at Stanford of identifying protected classes. It's not so easy to tease them out of data, but to try and see at whether the model, in fact, whether the training data is representative and whether the model, in fact, is balanced in its output. There are obvious limitations. The model output isn't really what we're most concerned about. We're concerned about the clinical outcomes based on the downstream actions from a model that you undertake. It's also challenging for populations that aren't American populations that we know well to identify who are the groups we should be worried about. We have this from labor law of protected classes, but in a novel population, what scholarship or methodology is even needed to identify what should constitute a protected class or who are vulnerable subpopulations is not straightforward. And that methodology doesn't fully exist yet. Um, so how to identify ethical problems before they come consequential? This is a methodology I put forward. Um, you can see on the left, it's in line with the FDA's software as a medical device. So on the left is just the conceptual pipeline of how medical technology gets innovated, right? There's the idea, there's development of the idea, there's calibration, there's the initial implementation of it, and then the recurrent use of it. Inherent to the design process are a series of questions that get asked that don't necessarily have ethical are not overtly ethical, but have values laden in them that, that, and you can see in the far right, that can call out certain ethical considerations that can come to bear. So things that you wouldn't even necessarily think about, like where you set the sensitivity or where you set the specificity, have implications for who is included and who is excluded from a particular tool. It hinges on a couple of premises, premises that I believe, but I submit to you. Um, this draws on work on values in design from people like Shilton, Brays, Mandersweet, there are multiple stakeholders impacted by any, this is AI, but honestly, it's any healthcare technology. And the stakeholders can be identified by examining the design and deployment context. Stakeholder groups themselves have different values and explicit or implicit goals for a tool that can and should be ascertained. The process of design and development involves making a series of decisions. How stakeholders make these decisions or would want these decisions made reflects their values. And this is the important one. Where stakeholder groups disagree, or their values are at odds about these decisions, where their values collide, that's where we think it's most likely that ethical problems and social problems are going to emerge in future. Right? I can't predict the future, but this at least gives us some guidance of where these labor frictions occur are likely to be the problems or the cascading problems that we've seen before. Some of these may be completely novel as we implement novel tools. Many, most will probably be likely resolvable by referring to causistry, by referring to prior examples that we've encountered. So an example from the non-healthcare context would be the first self-driving car fatality. Uber engineers were having trouble making it saleable, right? It was really juddery. It was, it was recognizing everything. They wanted to smooth the ride. And so in reducing the pretest probability and reducing its recognition of obstacles, they felt directly led to its failure to recognize a pedestrian walking a bicycle at night. And so you could see how a pedestrian would have been an important stakeholder to include in an AI tool being deployed on the roadway. And this pedestrian obviously would have wanted it, the, the sensitivity set differently than the engineers set for their values of trying to make it saleable and smooth. Obviously, safety would have been more important to the pedestrian. Okay, so how do we deploy this? This is our first case study of an AI tool. This is deployed over on the adult hospital, trying to predict mortality, near-term mortality for patients being admitted to the adult, adult medicine service with an eye to using that mortality to try and guide um, advanced care planning, which say that if someone has a high likelihood of mortality within the next calendar year, to flag them as being appropriate for consultation for advanced care planning. Um, through our interviews, we tried to map out all of the stakeholders as well as all the interrelated pressures. You can see from this 
what looks like a Netflix miniseries serial killer diagram that we are struggling with how to actually depict this in a methodologic way. The concentric circles are looking at the social pressures, the different arrows relate to the, the significance with which we think the interaction occurs between the different stakeholder groups and what influences they may have over them and what their interrelation is to the algorithm itself. We identified a number of areas where we felt the, the, the stakeholders were colliding. I want to call out a couple. Um, one was how you integrate the tool into the workflow, right? Do you give it to the patient directly? Do you give it to the bedside clinician? Do you give it to the palliative care clinician? Only wasn't so straightforward. The other was as a cascade of that, how do you ensure that it's only used or should it be only used for its intended purpose, right? Should it only guide advanced care planning? Or once you've introduced a mortality prediction for a patient, is that anybody's you know, value to use to make any decision they have. And then the other was because these studies are occurring, are occurring at very quick paces, um, uh, how do you avoid scrutiny, right? There's a great, great pressure to say, hey, we're working on this really cool project. Let's post about it on Twitter. Let's put it, let's put it out on our blog. Um, does that afford actual protection to the study itself and the way that we shield other studies? So the value collisions weren't subtle. This is one of the designers talking about interacting with, with administration when they were talking about deploying it. At one point, they were asking me, can you guys predict if patients have 24 hours or less? Because if they've got 24 hours or less, we're going to put them in observation and not admit them. And observation means they're not officially admitted. And if they die in observation, they don't count as a death, right? It's not against our regulatory metrics. And I was like, I'm going to vomit in my mouth right now because you're telling me you want to know they're going to die in 24 hours because you wouldn't put them in a normal patient bed. You'd put them in observation. So we gave some recommendations to the deployment team. One was looking like to actually study the different workflow implementation strategies. One was explicitly clarifying to clinicians, administrators, patients, that it was only evaluated to predict the need for advanced care planning, that it wasn't intended. In fact, to just relabel it as ACP needs probability rather than calling it a mortality prediction and putting it in Epic in the patient's chart. And then to talk about shielding their research from social media scrutiny, that it probably needed the same kind of protections that we afford to other clinical trials when they're underway. That if you want to say that we're doing it, that's fine, but to release early results and stuff was probably going to endanger how you proceeded with your research. Okay, so how do we bring this into the clinical care of kids more? I've recently started looking at end-of-life care in children with heart failure. So I want to talk a little bit about that and, and explain that, how we're trying to study that. And we're figuring it out as we go. So um, a few years ago, uh, David Rosenthal and David Magnus allowed me to work with them looking at this question of destination therapy for children. So for those of you who don't aren't in this space, in the adult world, ventricular assist devices, which are you know ideally pumps that you can be discharged home on, um, are put into adults often who are not transplant candidates, who for whatever reason, um, severe Alzheimer's, uh, a cancer somewhere else, are never going to qualify for getting an organ for transplant, which is you know which is a rare and precious commodity, and so they're offered this destination therapy, the idea that you implant a VAT. And it comes from studies where they showed that patients being maximally medically managed versus patients who got the VAD, the patients on the VAD wound up doing better than the medically managed patients. So they offer this as a therapy. And so David Rosenthal had this question of, well, is there even a space for that in the pediatric world? You know, we hadn't been offering it as destination therapy. The short answer was, was no, that many of the reasons that children were being um, excluded from transplantation were psychosocial. And the window between children who had psychosocial reasons that they couldn't get transplanted but could manage a VAD was, was tiny, if at all. This has borne out. Neha Perky, who's one of the intensivists here, did this study a few years ago. And, and really, in the thousand or so children who've been over the past decade implanted with VADs, the number who have been destination therapy is minuscule. And, and I can be corrected by my heart failure colleagues, but to my knowledge, almost none of them have gone in as destination therapy. It has all been what has proven to be a very long bridge that ultimately wasn't to transplant either because of patient preference or because of co you know concomitant problems, didn't wound up being destination therapy, but wasn't implanted as such. Um, but what did come out of our research was a challenge clinicians were facing with bedside care of these children. When the VAD began to lead to mor morbidities, he was still awake and cognizant and could talk. And we were at the point where continuing with VAD therapy might continue his life for some period of time, but he was suffering. He was really suffering, and there was not going to be any obvious benefit to him by continuing the VAD therapy. Deactivation is something different in adults where I think people, although it's a difficult concept in adults, they're a little more comfortable with this idea of end-of-life care. 
Um, David Magnus, one of the ethicists here at Stanford, a mentor, um, and I were working on issues around resuscitation and the changes that that, that has on people um, in the adult population. For lack of a better way of describing it, we likened it to the Tithonus problem, because, hey, you know, you're not an ethicist if you can't try and flash your humanities knowledge. <laughs> um, for those of you who didn't waste $100,000 on humanities education before going to medicine, Tithonus was a prince of Troy who was beloved by Io, the, the nymph of the dawn, and she begged Zeus to grant him immortal life, but she forgot to ask for immortal health. So Tithonus was bound, aging, becoming more and more decrepit, no longer the man that she had loved, but unable to die. And in this Tennyson's poem, he talks about how um, he himself is no longer known to himself, that he has changed who he is, but still cannot die and cannot be released from this. And so we likened it to this because I think that catches some of the challenge that people were facing, this dilemma of it is life-changing receiving these devices and it changes who the children are. Um, Beth Kaufman, one of the one of the heart failure doctors here, wrote this great paper talking about the emotional challenges that clinicians were having discussing end of life compassionate deactivation in VADS. And I think in one of the parameters, almost 70% of clinicians were disagreeing with families, even when families were requesting that. Um, Chris Futner, one of the ethicists and um, palliative care clinicians at CHOP, became came involved in this research. We wrote a paper with Seth Hollander, who has become a very close collaborator here at, at Packard, um, looking at potential reasons why that could be. I think two of them we've articulated, right? One is this idea that the children could be neurologically intact at the time of, of deactivation is very, very difficult. The other is this framing around destination therapy, right? I think in adults, when you talk about destination therapy, there's a great deal, even in the decision to implant the VAD, and Seth has done work on this I Decide trial through, through Colorado, around do you wanna do this? You understand that somewhat grimly, this destination therapy is a final destination, that latent in the placement is the discussion that there will be end of life care involved in, in doing this, and that at some point you will reach that point. And the third is, I think, now we'll see what happens with these new Impella VADs that we're putting in in the cath lab, but to date, VAD placement has involved damaging the ventricle, which is to say, when we talk about withdraw ethically, the principle withdrawal of a technology is the same as withholding it. We're talking about things like ICDs that are easily deactivated without really changing who you are, or even an endotracheal tube where you can take it out and the lung pathology is still the lung pathology that it was. But a VAD involves actually coring out part of the ventricle and damaging it such that deactivating the VAD, I think Seth quoted me, 95% of the children are dead within 10 minutes after deactivation and all within an hour. Um, it, cha it changes the nature of the end of life. And I think that all of that together is very challenging when you talk about the decision to compassionately deactivate. Um, <clears throat> Desiree Mikado, along with Seth, tried to bring a checklist from the adult world of, sort of well, so just practically, pragmatically, how do we do this? Um, this is a very detailed slide that has a number of sort of what you, know, what you should deactivate, what should you be thinking about. You could imagine, just like we have done with the AI tools, along the, this very practical series of checklists, give rise to a number of decisions that have latent in them values questions that have to be answered. So even if you just look at this also busy slide, the bottom, Questions about removal of other life-sustaining therapies when you're doing compassionate deactivation. Should you remove other life-sustaining therapies? What's the comfort level with decisions around this removal? How do you reset, how do you address team dissent? Because obviously, as Beth showed, it can be emotionally fraught, this decision. What do you do in terms of sedating a neurologically intact child? Can we do terminal sedation? Is that is that allowable? What do you do for a cognitively intact child or a conscious child? Who else should be involved in these decisions? When should they be involved? All of these have latent values in them. I want to share some of our preliminary work that we're doing. We're doing an interview-based study looking at clinicians. We'll also be doing families as well. This is spectacular work being done by Kim Pike Grimm, who's part of our research group here. She's spearheading these interviews, and so I want to share some of them. I think what shines through, and I, I have to put this out there, this is very, very difficult work. I have always respected my colleagues within the Heart Center. I, I, am, I am awed by what my heart failure colleagues do. The depth of bedside nurses, the clinicians, the allied nurse providers, the, the depth of their caring shines through very much in all of these interviews. 
We have seen many times, I think, our attendings and frontline providers who really can no longer do the job. They can't see the forest through the trees anymore. They have a hard time making good decisions for the patient because they're so blinded by their love of the family and kid and just wanting the child to survive. So I think latent in this is the emotional background of, of the difficulty with which these decisions are made. Um, <clears throat> there is conflict with families. So I've had one deactivation where I felt like it wasn't necessary. She was a three-year-old girl. She suffered a stroke that was somewhat debilitating and the mother just felt she didn't want her to suffer. And, and we were doing our best to try and educate the mother. Like children are resilient. There's a strong possibility she's gonna recover this and still be able to walk. She may be a little bit delayed and so on. And the mom just insisted that we compassionately deactivate. So that was a really difficult process to go through. Um, likewise, the other, um, we have the situation where we just want to let things take their natu natural course. And so we stay on the same doses of medicine. We keep escalating, but it reaches a point where the patient suffers. I mean, they're on high doses of epinephrine, vasopressin, and eventually these patients end up with black fingers and toes and patients become fluid overload. And it just makes the patient suffer even further. And the child essentially becomes unrecognizable at the point. And I think if anything, it causes more trauma for the families. There's a lot of emotional overlay in this. Um, the VAD morbidity is quite complex. There are things that are worse than death. Her skin was in such poor quality after months of hospitalization. They sewed lines into her sternocleidomastoid. The intracardiac lines were tied around her bones because the skin wouldn't hold a suture. We've seen these kids have bad skin quality because of chronic malnutrition, but that, how did we do this to a human child? How did we get to this point? We didn't help her. Everyone would walk into her room and burst into tears because they had never seen a human baby like that. Um, so compassionate deactivation offers an ability to avoid that kind of suffering, that kind of trauma for the families and for the clinicians that are involved. Um, it's more peaceful. Let me qualify that. It's peaceful in the sense that rather than letting the child deteriorate and just eventually arrest, which we don't know when that's going to happen, and have that event really traumatize stressed families, not just the families, but the entire medical team, we don't know when a patient's going to code. It just makes more sense to do it in a controlled fashion. So that's when we're pulling up medications such as, you know, morphine, Ativan, Versed, and we're giving these patients boluses, these medications, so they don't feel pain. They don't remember what's happening. And then we stop the ventricular assist device or deactivate it. And I feel like in those instances, things have been, been very peaceful. Um, this is balanced, again, to clinicians' desire to keep fighting. It takes a lot for us to deactivate a VAD. The patient has to be kind of towards the extreme end of not being able to be supported. We'll go to the depths of the earth to try and get a kid to survive. And I don't know if that's always the best thing. I think as a team, as a unit, we have a hard time letting go. And therefore, to allow the families to get to a point where they feel comfortable letting go until we've all decided that it's time to let go, then we kind of shock the family with that. And then we have a tendency to be surprised. Well, well how, why haven't the family gotten there yet? <clears throat> Obviously, we're struggling with both preserving life, but also keeping communication going. I mean, I think it's been demonstrated across healthcare, it's very hard to provide informed consent for any healthcare, even to physicians. We're talking about super specialized technological care that we're asking families in a very short period of time to become masters of and become partners of very difficult decisions, which may be more of an ask than families can, can bear, and yet is still shocking when the decision is that we need to move forward with compassionate deactivation. When, when, when there is no, we are now on a bridge to nowhere, we're not on a bridge to transplantation. Um, <clears throat> this is someone just identifying that that emotional challenge, it can be more difficult because the children might not be neurologically disabled. They may be awake before you decide to give them comfort medication prior to deactivation. It also doesn't feel like this big heavy thing, like an ECMO circuit or a ventilator. It's something that, especially the heart main, it's harder because it's not this big heavy machine that you're taking out of room. You're just turning a button off and that feels harder to do. There is some fallout of clinician the person who actually deactivates the dad feeling a burden of that responsibility. I mean, that's always been the case in deactivating, but somehow it seems heightened in this context. Um, after the VAD is off, and so how, it, how should it proceed? The patient is given more sedative just based on their physical appearance. We definitely don't want the patient showing any sort of pain or discomfort. Any sort of grimacing is just going to make the family feel guilty. It'll make them feel more traumatizing for them. We're calling out the fact that this is hard on everybody involved and that there is an element of, of stewardship in death as well. That if we cannot save this child, we can at least try and provide a good death. But that is not straightforward how to do that. And, and it toes a line of pursuing the theatricality and this terminal sedation, the right, the wrong, how you make that appropriately smooth is not, is not easy and straightforward. So who else should be involved? 
I know this is apropos of discussions that are going on right now. This was a recurring theme in our discussions. From a day one, ideally, if we had a big enough palliative care team that had the bandwidth, they should be involved in meetings from day one with families. Or more strongly, palliative care. They're not brought in until the patient is really, really sick, and I feel like they need to be brought in from the very beginning. And so I think that that's one thing we can do better. It's not only engage them when the patient's very sick, but when the patient begins their disease process and we're considering all these advanced therapies, I think that's something that we can do and we can do a better job of is engaging palliative care right at the beginning and not just when the patient is like suffering and the prognosis has gone from good to poor. Now, palliative care is capitalized in this, but I also don't think it has to be palliative care with a capital P. I think that the bedside clinicians who are caring, the, the heart failure clinicians, have great knowledge of the care of these patients, and palliative care with a lowercase p, just beginning to integrate those goals earlier on. I think that that's a challenge we've had that was called out with whether destination therapy was possible in these kids, that just making latent in the discussion that this is a possible end if we pursue this. We've looked at how we involve families better, how you share decisions in this context where the decisions change, where it's not just deactivating a vendor, where it's not the same as withholding the technology. It's not so straightforward. We're drawing on, this is Dana Gall's work. She was a fellow here who is now doing um, acute care cardiology at Children's LA, looking at how you bring family-centered care to rounding for children with, with cardiac disease, how you incorporate families better into discussion. It is not so straightforward and not so easy. Zoel Quinones, who's one of the other pediatric cardiac anesthesiologists here, quite provocatively has been looking at well, we do bring families into codes. We bring families in for procedures in the ER. Is it even possible to bring families in to see procedures in the OR um, as a way of communicating better what we're doing? That's not easy and not straightforward. Certainly in literature review, while there may be benefits to that communication for the, there's a, a trend towards it in interviews for the codes for um pediatric anesthesia induction and for labor and delivery where they have partners present, it can be very difficult to ascertain before the event which partner or which parent is going to be helpful and calming in that situation or which is going to be emotionally overwhelmed in the situation and going to distract the care team from the care they're trying to provide. And so that's a significant limitation. But I think it's worth discussing and talking about. One of the other challenges is also how we provide it multiculturally to patients who are not medically savvy or who don't necessarily speak English who are or, you know, or, or have other ableist limitations to their ability to be in the OR, how, how we do that. Those are all questions that are as yet unanswered. <clears throat> so what's the family view? What do families think about this? Christine Bowie, who is a, a fellow here just last year, who is now doing a palliative care fellowship down um, at, at UCLA, um, did this great study. There were only six patients of bereaved on VAD, but I think it had value because this is a very hard to access population. There were a number of things she identified, but one of which I want to call out is this notion that where in those six families they saw complex grief, where the families were still unhappy and grieving, was where there had been, been conflict around the VAD placement itself, where the parents had been swayed, swayed's not the right word, where the parents had decided to pursue the VAD and the adolescent patient had been apprehensive about pursuing the VAD. And that, that regret, because it didn't lead to ultimately transplant and saving was very burdensome on the family. And, and, and that's problematic because potentially we could do better, potentially by involving palliative care with a lowercase p, psychology earlier on in this process, maybe we could help guardrail these discussions so that we could at least help families involve, like decrease the complex grief that they suffer, even if we can't ultimately get the children to, to transplant. Um, Seth did a great job looking at our internal um, what we have done in terms of compassion deactivation here, which is about a little bit more, about 58% of our total VAD deaths. Um, he showed that that all of these children had complex morbidities. So this is, this is the scope of the problem we're encountering. When we have looked at the data nationally, um, pulling it across the Action Network, which is the consortium of all of the pediatric VAD programs and heart failure programs nationally, um, it looks like about the same, about a sixth of all children who get VAD are, are dying, are not making it to transplantation. 
Um, of those, so this is a diagram that, that Seth put together, looking at what the end of life trajectory appears to be for those children who pass away. So you can see from this, the ones who obviously immediately fail to recover, and some of the ones who have short-term improvement followed by decline, would not. we wouldn't be talking about compassionate deactivation. We're not talking about that sort of liminal state where they're not getting better, they're slowly declining, but they're not actively dying. But about half of those children are candidates or, or would be patients in whom we would have this discussion about compact, compassionate deactivation, right? So we're talking about a 10th to a 12th of all children in whom currently we're doing that. So it's not an insignificant percentage of the population. Um, okay, in the interest of time, none of this work I am doing on my own <clears throat> in a 21st century kind of way. We've called our lab group the collaboratory. I'm blessed with some spectacular collaborators. Um, and, and it's a wonderful group to be part of. And I also have to thank you know, all, all of our many funders and all the people who have weighed in and made this research possible. So thank you very much for letting me come and speak with you today about this. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chair. That was fantastic. Everybody agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> a question here. Very interesting talk, Dan. Question about your principle around non-malfeasance. While I, of course, agree this is important in principle, historically, harms are rarely fully appreciated prospectively, but can often be substantial in hindsight. On the other hand, shutting down innovation due to the potential for harm is also problematic. How do you suggest we think about striking this particular balance? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Great question. There's, there's, so in, in computer science, there's this talk about the Colling Ridge dilemma, right? Which is this idea that you can't study something until it's been deployed and activated and you see all the harms that happen. But that, at that point, it's too late to make structural, ethical, social changes that you need to study it early in its deployment and its design and find that sweet spot is very, very challenging. As I think I tried to call out from all of the non-healthcare um, references I was using, we really are having to extrapolate from prior disasters. And, and you're hitting it spot on that that is one of the goals of the research we're trying to do is this idea of anticipatory ethical and social research. I can't predict the future, none of us can, but trying to find places where early on it suggests that there's likely to be frictions are probably places where there's likely to be cascades of harms. We may also miss some. So making sure we have close post hoc surveillance is gonna be really important. Well, thank Megan Holly for that question. And Frederick Damanes, thank you for the fantastic talk. From a liability perspective, do you believe AI-driven diagnostic tools need to be held to a higher standard than their human counterparts? In other words, will error rates need to be near zero or can they just be objectively better than human outcomes for implementation? Oh, that's also a great question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think people in the AI community are really struggling with so, two answers. To that question. One is I think a lot of stuff is unfortunately going to get litigated, and that's just how it's going to play out. I wish it wasn't the case. If we can get ahead of it, that would be better. But the other is you implied in your question is a question that everyone is facing is, are we comparing apples to apples or are we comparing apples to oranges? Which is to say, what is the goal? When we're doing trials of AI tools, what is the gold standard to which we are trying to compare these AI tools to demonstrate that they are improved or beneficial? And that is not so straightforward. Obviously, there are error rates that are just not as well studied in how clinicians do diagnoses. And so is it fair to study the AI against the clinicians or like you say, to make it absolute and perfect? And that is not a yet answered question. Uh, question from any questions here? Okay, I have a question. You showed a data of the cost of modern healthcare administrators, uh, the cost of a CFO, C-suite person versus a nurse in aggregate. At the end, you talked about the cost of the emotional cost to families, to nurses, to doctors who are taking care of these kids. There seems to be a huge disconnect there. There's a financial reward to sit in the C-suite. There's an emotional burden and burnout. Could you just reflect on that briefly for me? You're trying to make me make me like reveal my Marxist. Um... <laughs> <clears throat> um, I, I, I... David Magnus and Holly Tabor, maybe Alyssa Burgar would criticize me for having trouble taking off my clinician hat and my clinician sympathies when I do my research. Um, I think that this work is exceptionally challenging and is exceptionally grueling. 
And I think that in society as a whole, we do a very poor job of financially compensating people who do spectacularly meaningful work, teachers, um, relative to the value of what someone does for society as a whole. Um, on the other hand, an argument can be made that without all of the financial resources made available, the material infrastructure within which we work, the hospitals themselves, the technology to build these devices like the bad devices would not be possible. And that balance between the two is a wicked problem of how do you find a better or worse solution between appropriately supporting and supporting clinicians so that they are appropriately compensated so that while they are up all night caring for these very, very sick children, they're not worrying about putting food on their tables against what a C recruitment for C-suite is requiring right now in the market. I have a note from Dr. Berger here. I certainly do not criticize that. Great talk, <laughs> Dr. Chair, that was a fantastic talk. Well, thank you all for having me. <clears throat> the preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.